Hey guys, it's Rodney from I Comply, and we're here for another segment of Having a Yarn on the Farm, where we talk about all things in the farming sector. And today we're going to talk sugarcane. And uh, I thought there's no better person to talk about sugarcane than uh, probably the most famous son of a sugarcane farmer. I'm talking about the current leader of the opposition, Mr. David Crisofulli. Dave, thanks for having a yarn with us. Rodney, thanks. But instead of yarn on the farm, we've got Zoom in the bloody room. I think yes, I'd we rather, have. We have I'd, Zoom I'd, in the room. I'd rather the real thing, mate. I'd rather the real thing in the paddock. But thank you for you, and thanks for your viewers for their time. Great to join you, mate. Thanks very much, mate. I'm I'm no expert on politics, so uh, I'm not Paul Murray. I'm not Alan Jones. I'm just, uh, but I am a Queensland voter, and uh, I want to open up by congratulating you on the rise to the top job. You've been in the top job now for a little over 12 months and uh, you came into this role when the state was in desperate need of leadership and I want to congratulate you on the things that you've done. You've had some great wins um, and if I had to sum up your performance over the last 12 months, it would be using two words and that's relentless persistence. You have relentlessly been out there fighting the good fight and uh mate i want to i want to thank you and congratulate you for that first up well mate it means a great deal to me rodney thanks very much i i said from the beginning i wanted my style to be one where if they do something right i'll say yep that's good for the state we'll back it if they do something wrong we whack them hard but we also say what we would do differently and uh i hope that's a style that people look at and say that's what we need in politics at the moment and with with COVID having dominated everything and everyone, you know, what's on everyone's lips, I wanted to make sure that we weren't creating um, noise for no reason. And I wanted to make sure that we put alternate policies. And I've focused heavily on things like service delivery and the health system at this in this state at the moment is in bloody crisis and that's before COVID. Law and order is out of control. But I also want people to focus on those traditional industries that may, have made us great agriculture, tourism and mining. And if we get the mechanics right and we get water security and we get land tenure security, mate, this state will go magnificently in a post-COVID world. We've just got to get through the, the chaos and the madness that is there at the moment. I, I talk to a lot of farmers, Dave, and uh, when you were appointed as the leader of the opposition, a lot of farmers were excited because they said, we've finally got the son of a farmer you know, that understands farming. And if you ask any farmer in, in Queensland right now, and I, I talk to farmers every single day, not just on my podcast, it's my job um, to liaise with farmers. They firmly believe there's severely, there's a massive issue with no one having a seat at the table that has a farming background. Um, you know, I've I've had the privilege of speaking to Tony Perrett, who's the Shadow Minister for Agriculture, who is a um, who is a farmer. He gets farming. You're the son of a cane farmer. You get farming. Um, there's not too many people on the other side of the fence that have driven a Polaris, driven a Massey Ferguson, um, or picked a peach tree. Um, that's a concern for farmers. It should be. Um, what's even more concerning is there's not enough people on the other side who've been in any form of business. You've got people who've uh, lived their life without having to know what it's like to pay wages and know what it's like to deal with cash flow issues. Uh, and we're lesser as a parliament for that case. But yeah, I'm, I'm proud of my background. I'm, I'm really proud of my dad and my mum for what they've produced and particularly proud of my late grandfather who migrated to this country when he was about my age actually, early 40s, came to here with absolutely nothing in his pocket. But boy, oh boy, could the little bloke work. And um, he cut cane and was able to eventually, after a year, afford to bring his family over and he bought a little share in a harvester and then a little share in the farm. And to this day, to my dad's great credit, he's taken that farm and turned it into a, a pretty good size enterprise. And um, you're right, I'm the son of a farmer. I'm also a very small farmer in my own right. I've got a couple of little farms, uh, sugar, back at home in Ingham. And uh, they're big enough, just enough uh, for me to continue to lose money on them and have to tip in the wage to keep them afloat. <laughs> the, life of, the life of a part-time farmer. It the life is, of any mate. farmer, really. I, um... You talk about your family history and, you know, I can resonate a lot with you because my my grandfather came out to Australia after the Second World War and he 
couldn't speak a word of English. And he was a, he was a tough man. He was a very tough man, my grandfather. And uh, he was actually a prisoner of war. And for 12 months, he walked all the way back to Italy. He escaped the prisoner of war camp with three of his mates. He walked all the way back to Calabria. And when he got back there and walked into the house, they thought he was a ghost because they'd already had a funeral. And it, it tough, you know, 12 months of walking. He came to Australia, he couldn't speak a word of English. And uh, the first job he got was plucking chickens at a chicken factory for Inghams in Liverpool in Sydney. And every morning he'd go to work and he couldn't speak any English. And the boss would say to him, good morning, stupid. And my grandfather would smile and he'd look at him and uh, he didn't know what stupid meant. And then every Friday night, like all the Italians did back in the day, he'd get with his mates and they'd play cards and, you know, they'd sit around and play cards and talk. And my grandfather's talking to his mate and said, you know, my boss really loves me. He said, you know, when, when I get to work in the morning, he doesn't talk to anyone, but he says to me, good morning, stupid. And my grandfather's friend said to him in Italian, Mark, it's significant, it's bubble. Stupid is bubble. He's calling you a bubble. So the next morning, my grandfather went to work and the Aussie boss said, good morning, stupid. My grandfather went bang, put him on his backside, walked out and become a market gardener and had a little tin shed. And he grew his veggies out the back and he sold them in his shed. As he made a little bit of money, he built another, he built a shop, then another shop, then another shop, another shop. Um, he built a strip shopping center where to this day is still there. Um, I got a lot of my knowledge about life, about work from my grandfather, who was a very, very simple migrant. Um, it's fair to say you probably had the same, Dave. Rodney, similar stories. And uh, my grandfather walked across Europe himself, um, exactly the same same thing after the war. Um, and our Ingham had a different Ingham variety, and that was a town called Ingham. So when he migrated to Australia, didn't speak a word and didn't know anything about sugar. You imagine coming from Italy into the searing bloody well heat of North Queensland, cutting a, a type of crop that you've never heard of, covered in hairy marys, people dying of Vale's disease, which was from the rat, the rat piss in the cane. Um, it was hot, it was hard. They lived in barracks, mate. You, you imagine living in a tin shed in North Queensland, the sun smashing down on you, but they worked. They worked seven days a week and they were paid well because uh, it was work that no one else wanted to do. And um, they saved their money. And like I said, li little, little start that he just bought a little farm and kept on going. And mate, when he died, um, and you know, it was very sad to, to see him pass at an end of an era. Um, but he, his English was so limited, but he didn't speak much at all full stop. He was just a humble bloke. He was just the most peaceful, hardworking, um, decent bloke you'll ever meet. And he came to Australia for one reason, and that was to give his family an opportunity. And, um, you know, within two generations, one of them had got an education. Um, that was me. Um, my, I only have one sibling. It's a sister. My sister's the most incredible small business person you'll meet. She's got, you know, a fleet of little shops that she she runs there in town, and her husband runs the harvester on the farm. So they're just great people. So he, he he's achieved everything that he wanted within two generations. He, you know, he had a family that, um, you know, my dad set himself up very well, and his kids have both gone on with a good work ethic. Okay, one of them's a politician, but you can't win them all, I guess. Well, mate, I think that uh, we'll give you a leave pass for leaving the farm because we need someone in politics that actually understands farming. So, uh, mate, we'll give you a leave pass on that one. But I talked to you before about your first 12 months and relentless persistence. You probably got that from your grandfather because it sounds like, you know, he had a relentless persistence approach to get out there and bust his backside every day. And, and you're right, like this is before machine harvesting. This is uh, hard yakka cutting cane. I tell you what, it would have broke a lot of people. Yeah, it, it was really tough work, and and, and look, um, in in public life, you'll get you get people who go in for different values and different beliefs, and 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 that's that's good. That's part of the democratic process. Um, what what does happen though is you can get caught up in in the lifestyle because you, you know you're always going places, and there's always food and there's always drink. I've been determined that I'm not going to become one of those politicians that uh, gets rounder than they are tall, and uh, I can. <laughs> I can report to you to this day, I'm still lighter than when I entered the parliament um, some time ago. 
and I intend to stay that way. So I get up every morning and I, I train my backside off because I spend too much of my life sitting in this chair right there. And uh, as a result, I, I make sure that I stay fit. It's, it's important. You've got to you got to have a healthy mind and, and in this job it's important that you don't get caught up in the trappings. It's important that you don't spend your life talking to other politicians. I've still got still got a very similar circle of friends from many years ago. I, I still speak to my best mate from high school uh, once a week. I still speak to dad nearly every other day. I make sure that I stay grounded and um, yeah, I, th I think that's the key to remaining as normal as possible. Mate, you talk about your... Uh get to the gym because you're sitting um, down every day. I saw a Facebook post of yours today when you were at school. One of your school teachers had been, had retired today and uh, I couldn't believe that you were A, the tallest person in the back row, but B, you obviously loved your mother's pasta because you were a little <laughs> bit tubby back then as a kid. <laughs> uh, well, I grew I grew early, but in fairness, everyone in my school had an Italian surname, so we're all our height. You're, you're, I think you're about the same height as me, so no, none of those short jokes here. So that's the first <laughs> one. Se secondly, I was I was pretty chubby all the way through school. E even at uni, I sort of carried a bit of weight. It, it wasn't until I realised that I can't eat pasta every day and I can't eat bread every day. And look, I don't want to say this because chances are dad will find it, but I've reduced the amount of sugar I eat as well. Yes, that, that, hang on. Well, dad, if you're listening, <laughs> I still go to the cafe. I still open them. And when the waiter's not looking, I tip them in. Tip them just the to the make cup. sure you're supporting the industry. I of course, <laughs> of course. And throw a couple down the sink, make sure the farmers are okay. But I have reduced the sugar intake a little bit over the years and I find that works not too bad. <laughs> How has that been for the sugarcane industry? Because you know, growing up as a kid, you know, my grandmother, you know, we'd stay at my grandmother's place. My father was involved in produce. He was a wholesale produce person. So he was always on the road. And on the weekends, he'd go see all these growers throughout Australia. And I'd stay at my grandmother's. And for breakfast, she'd get two eggs and about 10 jars of sugar and mix them all up with a little bit of masala. And, um, you know, these dietitians nowadays, they'd have a heart attack if they see what we grew up on. But with the change in, in um, you know, there's a lot of push towards sugarless, sugarless drink, sugarless lifestyle, all this. Um, is that affecting the cane industry? Is the demand waning or is there still a huge demand? No, there's still a demand because just remember, there's a whole heap of the world that is becoming westernised who are discovering uh, a different lifestyle and that involves sugar. So, look, it's everything's about moderation and we're still going to always need sugar in some commodity when you bake, when you cook, uh, in, in some drinks, in some portions. And as and as the Western and as the world becomes uh, becomes moving into a modern era, they use sugar. Now, the complication for us isn't the demand. The complication for the sugar industry is subsidies because of the, the political power that some nations have. And front and centre is India. Now, India at the moment subsidise in the tune of six million tonne on the world market. Why? Because the majority of parliamentarians in India, and I'll repeat that, the majority have some interest in sugar. They either own a farm, a mill, or they're supported by a constituency who the majority of people are farmers. So. It's real and um, Australia's tried to have a seat at the table and I know you've interviewed David Littleproud who's a, who's a damn fine minister, a Brilliant. damn fine minister and, and he's having a crack in that space and also trying to get the trade minister to, to, to get through the, through the World Trade Organisation to say to these guys, you can't keep subsidising a product to the point that you're distorting the market. That's what they are doing. They are distorting the market. Now, um, for the first time in a long time, this year the price is pretty reasonable and that's because of a number of factors including world shortage where there's been some floods and some disease which has reduced it. But be under no illusions, while you're getting paid to grow a crop and you're not doing it efficiently but you're being paid regardless, they'll keep meeting a, a market whether it's there or not and that, that is a real challenge. It used to be Brazil, and then Brazil moved, you know, a portion into ethanol, which sort of helped with that flow. Um, but there is a real challenge with world subsidisation of sugar, and we as a nation need to address diversification in the market, um, but also continue to find new markets who are willing to pay for sugar that comes from the cleanest, 
the greenest, the most sustainable, and the best quality sugar in the world. Uh, I'll right tell you what blew, blew me away, Dave, and I, I knew nothing about sugar cane. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, you know, I'm a horticulture man, I'm a fruit and veg man, and you ask me how to grow tomatoes or capsicums mm. or, you know, any orchard, I'll be able to tell you. Sugar, I knew nothing about. So knowing we're going to have a chat today, this morning I did some research about the sugar cane industry. And it's worth $2.2 billion in Australia. $2.2 billion. Uh, 95% of that is in Queensland. How are we ignoring the... How are we ignoring horticulture, sugar, farming? Farming is so big at the moment. Why, Why is the current... Um, the current government totally yeah. oblivious. To, well, you're talking $2.2 billion, just sugar. That's phenomenal. Well, there's, there's an easy answer, and that is because they have sought uh, to weaponise the debate and make these farmers look and appear like environmental vandals, which they aren't, which they absolutely aren't, but they've done it to try to harvest votes in other parts of the state. And they've thrown farmers to the walls because of it. And not just not just sugar, right across the board, there's been a real demonisation of farming. And I intend to change that. Now, don't get me wrong, there's an element of farmers that don't do the right thing. And you and I were talking about that when we had a cup of tea the other day. Yes. There's, there's an element of farmers that don't do the right thing. Well, throw the bloody book at them. But don't penalise yeah. the 98% who are bloody... They're, they're environmental champions, the, boat, the, the bulk of them, and I put my dad in that, in that category. So, you know, you talk about the impact of sugar. Yep, you're right. A little bit in northern New South Wales, but the, the bulk of it's Queensland. And if you look, if you go from Cairns south to Mackay, you have a look at the towns that rely on it, the Innisfails, the Tullys, the Inghams, the Burdekins, the, the, the Serenas. They, they, they are, these sugar towns, they... they the whole economy is based around a sustainable harvest and uh, I'm determined to support and back them, as I am with all industries. And, and you're right, mate, I see I see the growth and the demand in, in produce from our part of the world. We've got a golden opportunity in a post-COVID era where people are going to want our, our crops, they're going to want our horticulture, they're going to want our beef uh, because it's the best, it's the cleanest, it comes from the best um, quality in the world, mate, and we, we have to do that. So and Queensland yeah, grows know, the best produce, you know, yeah, Queensland that, grows it without a doubt. And Absolutely, best I'll, conditions, best best people. Uh, I'll tell and, you what was the hardest thing, and I, as you know, I, I do a lot in the hort sector, the hardest thing to cop this year for us was in the middle of a labour crisis and I have gone into fields that have just been killed off with Gramoxone because they couldn't get picked, okay? Yep. Farmers have just killed them off. Boom, can't pick it, walked away. In the middle of a labour crisis, you've got a Premier over in South Australia, and I don't know the man, but I've got a lot of growers in South Australia that went to his farmers and realised agriculture is very critical in South Australia. And he said, how can I help? They said, we need to get these workers into it and we need it quicker. The federal government came up with a great idea and they said, you know what we'll do? In Vanuatu, in Tonga, in Samoa, there's all these empty five-star hotels. Let's quarantine them over there for 14 days, bring them in. Adelaide said, yep, beautiful, let's do it. Started bringing in plane loads, plane loads, plane loads. Queensland, the Chief Health Officer, oh no, we can't. We can't bring in people from Vanuatu. The country's got no COVID, but we can't bring them in from there because they might bring in COVID. Now, farmers were frustrated, but when she let the footballers in, after she wouldn't let which the COVID-free country Vanuatu in, geez, that was hard to take for farmers. Farmers were absolutely going, this just defies logic, Dave. It defies logic. Uh, mate, those images of footballing wives parading around a pool while some Queenslanders lived in their car on the other side of the border. Some Queenslanders were ploughing in fields. Um, mate, they, they will stick and haunt with them forever. And you're right, Rodney, I've been uh, on a farm in Mandabra where the fruit was withering on the vine and they weren't planting for the next year. And that wasn't because of crop conditions, that wasn't because of market, that was because they just didn't believe they could get workers and that that is a that is a crying shame that is a crying shame in a country like ours to think that uh, that in a state like Queensland that offers so much that we would be reducing our throughput 
uh, because of the government's in, uh, inability to meet the market. And the person you refer to is Stephen Marshall, who's the Premier of South Australia. He's That's up the guy. soon for his election. Uh, he's early next year. And boy, oh boy, I hope he gets a, gets re-elected. He's a, he's a fine human being. Well, I'll tell you something now. He's got the farmers' vote because he listened to them and he fixed the problems. There was no labour crisis in South Australia. And the reason why there was no labour crisis, proactive leadership. And it came from him. And I've got a couple of big growers over there that had a direct link to the Premier. And he said, what do you need? And he made yeah. it happen. Sadly, that didn't happen up here in Queensland. We can't even get a call back. You know, I rang the the um, Minister for Agriculture, um, Mr. Ferner, and I rang him up and I I left a message for him to give me a call and I told him who I was and uh, I never got a call back. I put another call through and I never got a call back. I then sent him an email and said, look, I run a podcast having you on the farm. We've got some major issues. We'd love you to come on. I'm still waiting. Um, you know, that that to me is an absolute disgrace that you can't even get a return call. Um, you probably saw my email, probably saw my podcast with Dave Littleproud and knows which side of the fence I sit on. But as it may, you know, I wanted to give him the opportunity to talk to farmers through this platform and he just didn't want to have a bar of it. Rodney, I sit in rooms every day with uh, groups that represent uh, uh, people who... I know they don't vote for me, but that doesn't matter. You 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 front up and you talk to people because everyone matters. And um, some of that behaviour, it's not just him, it's across the board. People, the little people are, have never felt so little in this state. They've been stood all over. And have a look what we've had in recent days with this whole circus of this $150 for this test to come back into Queensland. They just dreamt it up because they wanted to have another fight with Canberra. They love it. They, they, they think that you know, Dave, one on of Canberra my works. One of my growers rang me last night and... You know, a lot of us, are a lot of growers are sweating on the border opening because there's a lot of workers down in Coffs Harbour finishing on blueberries that will come up to Queensland and harvest Queensland crops. There's a lot of um, backpackers in areas like Bathurst, which are finishing on cabbages, which will come up to Queensland. Now, there's already two tenths of bugger all backpackers, so we're all fighting for these backpackers. And one of my growers rings me last night and he said, Roddy, has you seen this 150 bucks to get into Queensland? And I went, yeah. And I think, what do you think of it? And I said, mate, I said, it's an absolute joke. And he goes, Rod, have you ever been down the Fortitude Valley, he said, and seen all the backpackers having a drink on a Saturday night? And I went, I have actually. He goes, you know where they go? They go to the bars that don't have a cover charge. They don't go into the nightclubs. They go to the bars that don't have a cover charge. He goes, she's charging a cover charge now and we're going to lose whatever workers we can get to Adelaide or to Melbourne. Um, it's not a bad analogy from a farmer. Yeah. Great, great analogy, and and you know what we we belted them mercilessly because we saw it for what it was, and they relented. Not before they blamed everyone else. They blamed the media. They blamed Canberra, and, but but some of the name calling and uh, for the Dave, premier, sir, I've mate, got to say, premier mate, of yeah. a state for the premier of a state to say, Canberra, Scott Morrison wants to give us COVID, COVID for, for Christmas. Christmas. Disgraceful. Come on, come on. That, that's that's unbecoming. No. It's unbecoming of the office, and 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 regardless who you vote for, mm. in the end, when someone's the Prime Minister or someone's the Premier, they're your Prime Minister, they're your Premier, right? That's that's just how it works. And to have those comments come out of someone's mouth, I, I, I felt particularly upset for my state, for my state, the one that I love, because uh, we're better than those comments. I, and, I was, uh, sure I was disgusted because being brought up as an Italian, the first thing you're brought up with is you've been brought up with respect. Now, I was taught to respect my elders. I was taught to respect the title. Be as it may, whether our Prime Minister is a liberal, liberal or Labor um, person, he's earned the right to be Prime Minister. He was elected to be Prime Minister. And, yeah. you know, she should respect that. But the total disrespect that she shows for the Prime Minister is a complete and utter lack of respect for authority. It's complete yeah. and utter lack of respect for the man that is leading our country. And I just think it's poor form and an absolute disgrace. Three silly games, silly political games. So, mate, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. Tell me about your little sugar cane farm up there now. When I did some work this morning and I did some research, um, it has been, you mentioned it's been tough on the sugarcane farmers with pricing. 
But one of the things I came up with was there's there's 1,800 sugarcane farmers now, and uh, you know there used to be six or seven thousand. So a lot of them have gone into other crops. I actually know I've got a couple of clients up in the burdock and that now grow rock melons that used to grow sugarcane, Italians. Um, one of the biggest things in horticulture at the moment is the little farmers are t finding it tough because the supermarkets are, the margins are so big, small, that you've got to go bigger and bigger and bigger in order to survive. Um, are you seeing that in sugar as well? Is it getting tougher and tougher for the little bloke? Oh, completely. My, my dad's farm, once upon a time, even two generations ago, generation and a half ago, that would have supported 10 families. And these days it's dad and dad runs it with one man, one full-time man. And obviously they get people into plant and you've got a harvesting contract, which um, as I said, my brother-in-law runs that and does a bloody good job of it. Um, and dad's about half that contract, dad's farm. But yeah, no, no, the small farmer gets squeezed out. So to give you an indication, a size farm that, that I own, uh, say, call it 50 years ago, you would have made a real comfortable living on that. These days, uh, no word of a lie, it pays my rates, my insurance, and a little bit of money for the old man to run it. <laughs> and uh, I'm not I'm not going out for dinner on the rest of it, I can assure you. So, And it, it's, it's a little bit different with sugarcane because, you know, if you're, a, if you're a, a lettuce grower, a tomato grower, you've got the right to say, okay, I want to send it to market or I want to send it to Coles or I want to send it to Woolworths or I want to export it. But with sugar, it's a little bit controlled. You've got to send it all to a mill, don't you? Yeah, you do. Um, we do have the flexibility these days to be able to um, sell at a time of your choosing so you can pick the market or try to pick the market. With that, though, you've got contracts that you've got to honour. So there's a there's a risk as well. If, you, if it's a wet year and you leave it in the paddock, well, then you're exposed a little bit. So yeah, it's a game, and but but that there has given a bit of flexibility that never that wasn't there previously. So that that's been a small win and and one that I'd always uh, always ensure that's there, and I'll fight tooth and nail for it. I'll tell you one thing that worries me at the moment about ag, and the reason why this worries me is I've, I'm working with a very large client at the moment that's doing a succession plan. Um, for his four kids um, on one of his farms. And mm -hmm. his four kids have all left the farm. One is an accountant in Brisbane, one is a draftsman in Melbourne, another one works in a law firm in, in um, Sydney. He turned around and he said to me the other day, he said, you know, Rod, he goes, mate, I'm drawing to a succession plan. I might as well put the place on the market and sell it because none of my kids want to get back into farming. He said, and what's worse, he said, we can't find anyone because all the ag college are closes, have closed. And I said, what are you talking about? And he told me that under the Labor government, this, since Labor government have been in turn, Burdekin, Dolby, Longreach and Emerald, ag colleges have all closed down. Where are the next generation of farmers going to come from, Dave? I agree. And, and there's, no, there's no hope in the long-term future of the industry. And we've got to change that. And the way to change it is to offer a mixture of jobs and we have to get back to training people in traditional roles but we also have to get back to training uh, the next wave of investment and that involves things like high-end research and development and I've seen some of the stuff that um, people who've come off the land have designed and done things like spray units that use the most up-to-date computers you've seen to reduce your chemical out output by 90%. That's not reducing it by 10%. I've seen spray units that can reduce your chemicals output by over 90 percent by using AI technology right now that's all been developed for people who've come off the farm that's the next wave of opportunity so the the answer I'd give your mate to that question is there is nothing stopping any of his sons or daughters running that farm in time remotely from their <laughs> accountancy in Brisbane um, but we need the mix we need people who are on there working with their hands we need people who want to invest wherever they're from, and we need people who are driving research and innovation to make things more competitive and looking for product diversification. And particularly in sugar, one of my great laments is that we've done bugger all of it. And um, there's so much you can do with sugar, so much you can do with cane, and yet it's only the crystals that we look at. And there's so much between plastics, between co-generation, between gardening opportunities, um, as a fuel source, ethanol, there's, there's, there, is, there are so many opportunities. 
we've just got to get serious about research and development. And that's where a government plays the role. Government incentives can lead the private sector and give confidence to invest. I am bullish about the farming industry and the farming sector in general and um, I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is and invest in it both personally and at a government level because I I think the best days for agriculture are ahead and I can't wait to see what we achieve. Why why do you think that um, you know the farmers have been crying they've been crying and you've you've listened to farmers and um, you know you've been up to the Burdekin and you've visited you know I know you visited clients of mine uh, mutual clients um, why does the current party just not listen to such a big sector? Why? I just um, don't get it. Um, I don't think they understand farmers. Um, there's, there's no, there's not enough of that influence in their party room or their party. We, we do have that. And you mentioned you'll be talking to Tony Perrett. Um, Tony's, Tony's a great, great mm-hmm. farmer, great cattle producer. But we, we have others. You know, Deb Frecklington's got an interest in, in property and has done. Um, there are a number of people in our party room who who get who get the land, and that's there'd probably be a lot important. that have sat on a Massey tractor or that have driven an ATV. Um, absolutely, I, absolutely, I don't think and that, there is and on that the other helps. side. Yeah, but but I also think it, because um, because of that lack of understanding, it's been easy pickings to play to this rubbish underlying thing that our oh, farmers are environmental vandals, and they've used it effectively in the city. And uh, that's where we've got to take a bit of responsibility too, as farmers. We haven't sold ourselves well enough because farmers by their nature are doers and most of them are like my late grandfather. They're just humble people. And as a result, they just shut up and go to work. And in the modern era, you can't do that. And I point to cotton as an example of what can happen when an industry refuses to cop it and they went on the front foot. And a couple of decades ago, cotton in this state and in this country were demonised and victimised. Remember the, the mm. poisons, the water, yeah. blah, 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 job all lot. The noise, right? Yeah. Well, well, what cotton did is cotton showed their progression towards sustainability and they made people feel fr- proud about cotton. So all of a sudden, you're talking about, my goodness, look at this, this catwalk in London's got Queensland cotton and holy, it's the best cotton in the world. And oh, all of a sudden, you, you, you're proud to be from a state of the sustainable cutting edge farming. That was all done because an industry refused to cop it. And uh, I want sugar to do the same. I want sugar to push back hard and say, no, 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 no. This is what we've done sustainability and this is what we're going to. And I want the same for every industry to do exactly the same. And that's why I'm a fan of best management practice, BMPs, best management practices, because it's the farming sector saying, we take this seriously. And that's got to be the framework for us to tell the story of Queensland agriculture. It's good for you. It's good for the environment. It's good for the economy. We just can't cop it lying down. And I I say that as a farmer, not as a politician. But as a politician, I say that message helps me pick it up and then talk to all of these hundreds of thousands of people who sit within, you know, five minute drive of where I'm sitting at the moment. And uh, that's the future of Queensland agriculture, and I, I, I want to be in the chair driving it. I've I've been really, and you talked about farmers being demonised, and you know, in horticulture, we've copped a really bad rap from the unions about being exploiters of labour and doing the wrong thing, and you know, the unions are running out of members in the building sector, so they're now focusing on ag to try and sign up as many people as they can. And look, I I get that there's a role for unions in any organisation. I've got mates of mine work in logistics and, you know, they swear by they're a member of the union and it helps them. But I wish they'd state the facts. I mean, they've been peddling this bull crap that workers are getting $3 an hour working on farms and they're all getting exploited. I put it to the unions. If someone is out there earning $3 an hour, don't come out and say that this person's earning $3 an hour. Come out and say this person's earning $3 an hour on Joe's farm and don't go there. And let's get that bastard out of the industry because 99% of farmers are not paying award. They're actually paying above award to look after their workforce. And most farmers value them. And I mentioned that my dad's uh, got one man full time. He's been with my dad for probably 20 years now. You, you don't you don't last in a job for 20 years unless- You're not getting looked after. 
Yeah, well, and also he feels part of it. The successes they have on that farm, he owns it. He, he, he drives it. There is one bloke on my dad's farm that gets three bucks an hour. He gets out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. And that's he, your he, dad. <laughs> has all these expenses and some years when he works it out, it's about three bucks an hour. But <laughs> no union that wants to touch him, unfortunately. Geez, don't say that. They'll come out and say, we well, you know a bloke earning three dollars an hour on David Christopher's cane farm. They're yeah. not gonna mention that it's your father. <laughs> Dave, I won't take up too much of your time. Mate, I wanna ask you in the 12 months that you've been in power, what's been your biggest win? Is it bringing um, the two young boys home, Memphis and Lenny? Yeah, you got it. The wins for the little people. And um, I, I, I might give one little plug and that is if people wanna jump on my Facebook page, have a look, there's a video that we've put together which um, isn't me telling the story, it's Queenslanders telling the story. Queenslanders are on waiting lists to get surgeries that we blew the whistle and got them surgery. Young kids that we got home, people who were um, involved in the youth crime crisis and we you know, try to bring a bit of sanity there. It's the wins for everyday Queenslanders. And, and hey, we're going to be taking to the next election an ambitious uh, agenda on agriculture, tourism, mining, as well as building infrastructure to, to relocate businesses to the to the state. Um, but that that'll come. That'll come in time, and I've got every confidence we'll do electorally well. In the meantime, it's the wins for the little people holding a government to account. But but to know that we've had an exemption unit in this state that only worked when we took stories to the media. That's the power of doing good, and. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe I, it's, I think it's. Maybe I love it's, what I love what you do to raise awareness for the punter. And you know, my my head office is in Caboolture, and I'm not the fittest bloke, and I've got a lot of pressure on me, and I'm probably a candidate for high cholesterol or what have you, and I'm probably going to end up in Caboolture Hospital one day. Thank Christ you're fixing that mess, because Jesus, I wouldn't send my. Actually, I wouldn't say I wouldn't send my dog there because I love my dog, but. The neighbour's dog that barks every night at midnight. Geez, I wouldn't send that dog to Caboolture Hospital the way that is at the moment. Yeah, it's sad to see. We've got two hospitals in this state. And you know what, what hurts me the most is it's almost as though because it's a low socioeconomic area that the government's just been willing just to wash it away. Oh, we're going to do an inquiry and they didn't really look at it. These are people who have never had a voice all their life. And um, you know what? Uh, it's not an area that electorally has been very good for my side of politics. And if we're being brutally honest, I, I wouldn't say to you that it's one that we'll probably do well in the future in. But I don't care because they're Queenslanders and we went into bat for them. And uh, by the way, we're not finished on that. By the end of this term, you will see a scandal come out of that hospital that will show there were people who know things that they should have blow, blew the whistle on. And uh, we're going to get justice to a whole heap of people. And in the process, get ready to fix the health system because uh, Queensland Health has never been in a worse shape. Remember when Anna Bly said it was a basket case? Well, it's worse now. Ambulance ramping's worse now than it was then. And uh, I'm determined to give a serve, level of service to Queenslanders should be proud of again. Dave, over the last 12 months, when we've needed leadership more than ever, mate, you've shown it. And you've been, you know, we talked about relentless persistence. You've covered just about every square metre of Queensland. Um, you know, wherever there's an issue, you're out there bringing that issue to light. It's disappointing that you have to put media pressure on for them to do their job. They're elected to do a job and they, they should be doing it. And that's disappointing. But, you know, you've been an advocate for small business. You've tackled the hospital crisis. You've tackled ambulance ramping. But most importantly, you're trying to get the government to see reason. And I love what you say when you say you can be safe and still have a heart, have a little bit of compassion. Um, you know, there are still people across the border living in cars, not able to come home. And as a Queenslander, that's disgraceful. It's pretty sad. And they've been treated in pawns in a political game. But um, one, uh, one of the things I couldn't work out was, you know, and there's people on the other side of the border living in their car. They can't drive 30 minutes to go home, but they've got to go to drive all the way back to Sydney Again, and hire like someone to bring all their, their car on a tow truck all the way back to Gold Coast, jump on a plane and come back. How, how does that make sense, Dave, really? Uh, you've missed one part of that. 
jump on a plane with 300 others, come back, and then somehow get from the Brisbane airport back to home, whether home's Gold Coast or, or, or Sunny Coast or somewhere in Brisbane, get in a plane, and then you're right, and then pay a towie to bring the car back over when they could go non-stop for an hour and a half and be home. But this is it, no common sense, lack of attention to detail, all about the high end, oh, I'm gonna keep you safe. Well, you can be safe and you can still have a head and you can still have a heart. So yeah. we'll keep fighting, mate, we'll keep mate, fighting. All you can do is keep fighting. Dave, on behalf of all the punters out there, and that's who you are, you're out there representing the punters, you're out there representing the little bloke, small business, farmers, mate, Keep fighting the good fight. Keep keeping these bastards honest. And uh, on behalf of all Queenslanders, one year in the job, you're doing a top bloody job. You're doing a great job. Keep the pressure up. I've got no doubt you probably could count on one hand how many times you've got to kiss your wife goodnight over the last 12 months because you're, you're out covering every square metre of Queensland, making sure that you're keeping the Labor Party honest. And uh, mate, keep fit because you've got three more years of trying to do it before you get that seat in the top job. Rodney, thank you to you and your viewers. Thanks for having me. And remember, next time you have a cup of tea, four sugars is better than three. And if you don't in the coffee, the sink's fine, but give a farmer a break. All the best. Good on you, Dave. Thanks for having me on with us. Thanks, mate.